Okay, greetings, uh, everyone. At uh, this is Van and my wife Vivian on this Sunday. It's the second Sunday in August, August 11th. Actually, it's my brother's birthday, uh, my younger brother. We are continuing on in our study in uh, 1 Corinthians. We have uh, reached chapter 10. Actually, we're almost finished with chapter 10. So, uh, Paul's first epistle to the Corinthians and that there should be no schism in the body. And so that schism, you know, is, uh, I, it, it was poorly, un I had poorly understood this matter of a division. So I always thought it was, you know, like division in our Baptist church or division in our Presbyterian church or, or what have you, or divisions between Catholics and Protestants. It, uh, this schism in the body, we're gonna, we'll cover again, but it had to do with the saints a schism between the saints and the call to be saints. Now, if you're hearing that for the first time, uh, it is scriptural, and we'll endeavor to point it out that there are saints and there are called to be saints, and they are different saints. Uh, so we are a study that is dispensational, rightly divided understanding of the word, um, and we we use the King James Bible as our authority. So I, we don't we don't refer to the Greek um, because there's no I, to my thinking there is absolutely no takeaway if I were to say to you in the Greek the word is this or in the Greek the word is that. All that does is it provides like a puff up. They go, oh wow, Van must have learned some Greek. I don't know a lick of Greek. And, and so there's no reason for me to refer to the Greek. It, the King James Bible is in English. The challenge for me, and it's a tall challenge, is to just understand the English in the King James Bible. So for that, um, not only do we pay attention to punctuation and context, we use the Oxford English Dictionary. That's the OED. So all the word definitions that you will see in our studies uh, are using the Oxford English Dictionary. I, I usually um, uh, make a note with the definition to, to certify that the definition is from OED. Sometimes space is a little bit tight. If you don't see the OED letters there, but just rest assured that the definition has come from the Oxford English Dictionary. I haven't just Googled a word to see what the current meaning is. All right, here's our, our, our social presence, our website, um, and and encourage you to check out the website. There's a, we have a tab, it's on the, it's on the homepage, it's also under a separate tab. There is, there are 27 Bible questions, and um, I think it's a pretty good study to go through the 27 Bible questions. There are no answers, there are only Bible references for the 27 questions. Okay, now, I mean, before we launch into uh, where we have left off in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, I'm going to just remind uh, myself of what Miles Coverdale said, Miles Coverdale, who produced, he actually translated the first uh, English Bible, English-speaking language Bible, of both the New and Old Testament, the... Um, the first translation of the English New Testament was done by Tyndale, but it was Miles, uh, Miles Coverdale, who produced an old and new, what we call an old and new Testament uh, English Bible. And he said, and notice this, so this is way back in his time uh, of the uh, 1500s, the 15th century. He says, it shall greatly help ye to understand the scriptures. So note the sentence, to understand the scriptures. And so there I am, I'm trying to understand the scriptures. And now he went on to say, if thou mark not only what is spoken or written, but of whom and to whom, with what words, at what time, where, to what intent, with what circumstances, considering what goeth before and what followeth after. So that was... That was Miles Coverdale's guidance in understanding the scriptures. Now, I'm going to ju jump forward to the 19th century to a fellow by the name of David Cooper, Dr. David Cooper of the Bible Research Society. Now, David Cooper is a brother in Christ, or he's passed away now in 1965, 
and and he loved the Lord. He was a he was a, a, a man of scripture and he studied hard. But notice what he did in terms of his guidance uh, in Bible study. And, and this is these are his words, as far as I can tell from from sources. He he wrote, quote, the knowledge of certain rules of interpretation. So he starts off that for, for me to understand the Bible, I have to have, according to David Cooper, I have to have a knowledge of certain rules of interpretation. So he has taken the word that David, uh, rather that Miles Coverdale used, Miles Coverdale said understanding. David Cooper said interpretation. So changing Coverdale's word of understanding to, to Cooper's word, interpretation changes everything. So interpretation now is to take something that I've read and to take it from what I see and to move it to something else. Uh, so we talk about interpreting a language. Uh, and now in order to do this, so I have no skills in interpreting, uh, David Cooper said that there are certain rules. So now, in order for me to do what David Cooper said, I have to have knowledge of the rules in order to understand the Bible. He went on to say, and the observance of these rules when studying the scripture is very important and helpful in arriving at a clear, and there's the word, understanding of God's word. So what David Cooper has now said is that it is no longer sufficient to simply understand the English language. No, I have to understand the rules of interpretation. So what he's done is he's removed from me. So I would be considered then a scoundrel for not knowing these, these rules, although I know some of, this, of their rules. But I would be considered, so I'm actually, I'm referred to as a layman. Uh, because I don't know their rules. The scholars the rules. Sco and these are scholarly rules. And there are pages upon pages of rules for how to interpret the Bible. And so when I say, well, this is what I understand of Scripture, they would say, well, no, you don't understand because you're not following the rules, the scholarly ru rules uh, that need to be observed. Anyhow, so uh, I, just to show how things have changed and that's why today we have such difficulty because we no longer are focused on understanding now we're focused on interpreting all right let's move forward we'll go into now uh first corinthians chapter 10 uh we're picking up at uh, verse 14 uh, into 15 uh, where vivian will be reading <laughs> yes 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 14 and 15. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to wise men. Judge ye what I say. Okay, so this is where we left off last time. Just a little bit of an overlap where Paul said, Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. Now, so concerning idolatry, they were not, not to just take heed but they were to flee and and i was i was reading i was reading in genesis chapter uh, i was reading in genesis about uh, <clears throat> uh joseph and the uh the the servant he was servant to what potiphar's yeah household household and it was potiphar's wife who wanted uh joseph to lie with her uh, that you know to to go to, her. yeah he, he to was, she her. she tried to seduce him yeah. and what joseph did was he fled from her presence so this is so paul is giving this instruction to the uh, call to be saints to flee from idolatry so it's important it's it's actually we're going to be he, paul's going to be building on that so we want to just emphasize that as we continue on now so paul says i speak to wise men Judge ye what I say. So this is this is indicative that Paul wanted his audience to be a thinking 
audience. He wanted them to think about things and to judge for themselves. So I am not just to hear and receive because somebody said it. I should hear, but then I should think about it. Does it make sense? Uh, when I just accept what somebody says without thinking about it, and, and this is where Neil's comments are very appropriate, when I just say something without thinking about it for myself and saying to myself, does this make sense? Run it through my, I have a brain for a reason. Then I'm, I am missing uh, using, taking advantage of the things that God has given me. So the audience focus now is going to transition. We're going to go into verses 15 to 22. So the now in verses 15 to 22. So first, the first 14 verses, Paul spoke about some of the history of, of uh, the Hebrews, of Israel. This was history of which they were ignorant. And uh, there were a number of people that shared with us that they found things in this review of those first 14 verses that they either didn't know or had clean forgotten about. So it's good for us to review. So we're finished with the first 14 verses now in that, verses 15 to 22. That was our study last, last week. week, our last week's study. Check it out. Uh, yes. And in, in these verses now, the call to be saints, which is one group. And the saints, which is another group, uh, came together on occasion. And when they came together in fellowship, there were some challenges. Now, Paul, having warned about idolatry, further warns both, both the saints and the called to be saints, to know the difference between that which has been sacrificed in worship to God from that which has been sacrificed in worship to devils. So the Gentile pattern of worship was to be avoided. And we know from what Paul's experience was on Mars Hill that the Gentiles had many strange gods which they worshipped. And so they those were to be avoided. Now, this is instruction that is to the saints and the call to be saints. It actually, to my thinking, is not necessary for us today uh, we There are no more saints and called to be saints around. It would be wise to stay away from of idols, of course. But we're really, I mean, we're saved and we're sealed. We're not really concerned about idolatry anymore. We have been made a new creature in Christ by the salvation that we have as a result of the work that he did. Now, before we go further, let's just, we talked about these two groups, the saints and the call to be saints. And I'm going to put this chart back up and go through it rather quickly. But this is important to establish that there are, in fact, two groups of saints uh, that Paul is dealing with. There, there are saints which uh, are of prophecy. And these, and, and this is, these are matters. When we say prophecy, these are matters where Paul says you can you can search the scriptures. Actually, Jesus said search the scriptures, because there was history. There was there were matters that they could search the scriptures and they could learn from the scriptures. That would be prophecy, things that were written down, that were to come about. Then there is the matter of mystery. So Paul speaks of mystery. He also speaks it of it as being unsearchable. So we said, well, what's, what does unsearchable mean? It means it is not to be found. Something that is unsearchable, I cannot find it. Why can't I find it? Because it's not there. In, in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament. The so there are things that are in the scriptures and there are things that are just not in the scriptures. They were mystery, unstated by God until... And this is a rub point for those that hate dispensational thinking. Uh, this is a rub point. They were mystery, unsearchable, could not be found until they were revealed to the Apostle Paul, who then revealed them to the rest of us. So that's the basic division. Uh, and, and, and it's not Old Testament, New Testament. It is prophecy and it is mystery. 
And so there's a division between the two. Now, this division in the future will go away, but right now we are in a state of prophecy, mystery, and there is a division. The foundation of all of this is indeed Jesus Christ. He is the foundation and the chief cornerstone of all of this is indeed Jesus Christ. Now it is built upon the apostles and prophets. Now there are two groups here. So let me just point this out. Under prophecy, we have a group. It started with Peter, the apostle Peter. He had the kingdom gospel. He was speaking to the circumcised. They were called the saints. And there were also proselytes. What's a proselyte? A proselyte is an uncircumcised Hebrew who has now uh, decided to submit to uh, the, the saints and to become a circumcised saint. So he would go to synagogue. He would have to learn and then he would graduate, he would be circumcised, and he would be included as a saint, but he would still be referred to as a proselyte. So he was a second-class saint. So this is a group. Altogether, this group is looking forward to, they're looking forward to the new covenant. So there's the old covenant, there's the new covenant, and they're looking forward to the new covenant. They were looking for, this is prophecy, they were looking forward to the first and second coming. Why? Because it's prophetic. The second coming is when, and I've, I've made a change in my chart here, my arrow now goes down. So second coming is when Jesus returns, at the second coming, where does he return? He returns to the earth. There is a kingdom on earth. And he is coming, he's going to set his foot down on the Mount of Olives, and his kingdom will be on earth. According to the Old Testament scriptures. All of this can be found as prophecy. It's all available. Now, on the other side of this division, this line, this is why it's important to be dispensational, because without this division, this just becomes a confused mess. And people say there's no rapture. People say, oh, it doesn't make any sense. So there's all sense, all kinds of confusion. On the other side here, the right side of the chart, the Apostle Paul is the Apostle of the mystery. He has the grace gospel, not the kingdom gospel. He has the grace gospel. It's a different gospel. He is ministering to the uncircumcised. They are being called to be saints and without the need for circumcision. So that's under grace. Not only is he calling these uncircumcised Hebrews, but through these uncircumcised Hebrews who are being called to be saints, there are partakers of the benefit. Now, if you've never heard that term before, it is very biblical. You'll find it in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 2, where Paul is teaching his saints, his call to be saints, that they are to be uh, courteous to the partakers of the benefit. I am a partaker of the benefit. I come, I descend from paganism. My ancestors were pagans and fire worshipers. And we did not have the knowledge of the scriptures that even the call to be saints, the Hebrews who were uncircumcised, had knowledge of the scriptures. But the pagans, like the Armenians, the Brit uh, Ooh, Britannia, the, Brit the, the, Brit the Spanish, the, 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 the Gauls, yeah, oh, the, yeah, the, <laughs> all, every, all the rest of us, we were in paganism. And so what Paul is saying to the, what he says here in, in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 2, is th that the partakers of the benefit are beloved. They're saved and they're beloved of God. So he tells the call to be saints, be kind to them. All right, so that is the second group. So we've got two groups. There is a division. This is the division. And 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 uh, Brother David and Jane, were, were when they realized that there was a mistake in, well, I shouldn't say a mistake. 
there was a misunderstanding in the traditional right division uh, chart. Uh, David and Jane uh, encouraged us, you know, we should really, we should correct this, you know, this misapprehension. And so this is why this chart has come about. So now we have the division is between the saints and the call to be saints, of which all of us who are Gentiles of the nations we're, and believers, we are partakers of the benefit. So we're there. We're on the map. We are a new creature as a, as a result of the mystery. And what we are looking forward to is not the second coming, which is prophecy. What we look forward to is the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Now, if you've never heard the words high calling of God in Christ Jesus, Paul said he pressed forward to the prize of the high call. This is the, the calling of on high, the calling on high of God. You'll find it in Philippians chapter 3, verse 14. This is when... The Lord descends and he calls his, his uh, body, he calls us up. And because our, our citizenship is in the heavenly places. Paul says our conversation is in heaven. Now that word conversation, according to the OED, gives me the understanding that Paul is speaking of our, our citizenship. So there are those that are citizens of earth. There are those who are citizens of the heavenly places. I'm one of them. In fact, all those that are hearing this study who have decided to believe God for salvation, your citizenship is in the heavenly places. We're, we are not citizens of earth. We're just passing through. Even, and we're, even those who are ignorant. Yeah, it. <laughs> and it doesn't matter how you do. Ignorance, ignorance will not stop. There are going to be a lot of believers who believe God they believe God has saved them, and and there's going to be there's a there's a there's a moment coming when we will be caught up to the heavenly places, and there are going to be droves of individuals who will be stunned to find themselves no longer standing on the earth, but somewhere up in the upper atmosphere, being gathered into the to the presence of Jesus. It's gonna it's a it's gonna be a glorious moment. So. We wanted to go through this. This chart is on our front page of our website. And if you've had trouble making heads or tails of it, we've now gone through it so that you can see what this chart is uh, attempting to convey. It is a new creation. That, I mean, I should say the, ch the chart is novel. It is, uh, it is a, an, a, our attempt to say more accurately what is going on during this present dispensation of the grace of God and the division between the saints and the call to be saints. All right, so let's, we're going to move forward now. That's enough, blah, blah, blah. It took a quarter of an hour to say that. Um, let's move. Vivian will read now uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, a few verses. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 15 through 17. We already started here. Yes, yeah. I speak as to wise men, judge ye what I say. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we, being many, are one bread and one body. For we are all partakers of that one bread. Okay, so Paul says, I speak to, I speak as to wise, judge ye what I say. So we've, we've already elaborated on this. This, these are important words. We should all remember this to be wise people and that we should be judging. Everything we hear, uh, judge. Judge for yourself. What I'm saying is not to be followed. Judge what I'm saying and judge it for yourself. The cup of blessing which we bless. Now remember, Paul has just said flee idolatry. Now he's going to do a little bit of a comparison here. There is a, there is a, um, um, there's a, uh, <laughs> I've, I've lost the word again. There, there is something that they go through, uh, and an ordinance. Uh, thank you. <laughs> I, could, <laughs> I couldn't find the word ordinance in my brain. 
we we go through this ordinance and uh they and he says it's this is this communion of the blood of christ the bread which we break is it not the communion of the body of christ and he says for we being many are one bread and one body so he's speaking now to both the saints and the call to be saints and he's emphasizing we're many but we're one bread we're one but there is only one body now we we dwell in different places uh, there's a there's an aspect of the body which do, which is going to dwell on earth there's an aspect of the body which is going to dwell in the heavenly places at present time we're all on the earth but there 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 there's a day coming when when we will be relocated appropriate to where our citizenship is for we are all partakers of that one bread so both the saints and the call to be saints partook of that one bread so the saints understood from the old covenant this is the this is prophecy now this is the law the old covenant the need for the shedding of blood to restore fellowship with god so they had sacrifices and they would do these sacrifices to be restored in fellowship with god that's the old the call to be saints learned from paul the blood of christ resulted in a righteousness a new creature in fellowship with god so now th th this is these are the two groups one has been one is being restored by they have to endeavor they have to continue because this is the group the saints are the group that can be made estranged they won't they they don't lose their sainthood but they can be uh, they can be made estranged by sin. But the call to be saints, and indeed, uh, Vivian and I and all of us as partakers of the benefit, we cannot be separated from the love of God. Paul makes that very clear. This matter of having to confess your sins so that you can be in right relationship with Christ, you know, that's all because of poor poorly understanding where things are to be divided in scripture. Now, let's not uh, make it difficult for those people who are still confused with scripture uh, because uh, we understand it. It's not a matter of salvation, but if you, if you can get your arms around this and understand that as a partaker of the benefit from the call to be saints, we are with God. Uh, Jesus and cannot be separated from his love no matter what I do in this life no matter how badly I sin I, I cannot be separated because we've been sealed with the righteousness of God and we're a new creature mm -hmm. and God is no longer looking at this old creature of me than the old creature than the old body he that he's already forgotten about that in he, his flesh and he, yeah he's or god has already moved on and he sees me seated in the heavenly places that's what he's looking at he's not looking at me messing around on the earth doing right and wrong things uh you see that's the old doctrine okay now vivian will 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 uh, continue with verses 18 to 22 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 18 through 22. Behold Israel after the flesh. Are not they which eat of the sacrifices partakers of the altar? What say I then, that the idol is anything? Or that which is offered in sacrifice to idols is anything? But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. Ye cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. Ye cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? Okay. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep in mind, this is instruction from Paul to saints saints and called to be saints but especially now uh, the saints who are who are used to the old covenant and the rules and the regulations of the old covenant 
are, are Paul is going to try and help them through. Uh, they need to think this through. So Paul says, Behold, Israel after the flesh are not they which eat of the sacrifices partakers of the altars. So in fact, Israel after the flesh uh, are not they which eat. So yes, they ate. They ate of the sacrifices. When they, when they sacrificed something, they did eat. The fact is, everyone in the flesh needs to eat. So including... And this is interesting, including the the Israel's priests of the tree, the tri, tribe, tribe, <laughs> tribe of Levi, uh, and and they were I don't know if you if you know this specifically, but the Levites, uh, the priests, were without land. They had no land grant, uh, so they were not able to raise animals for food or sacrifice. The Levites were without land. They so, have no inheritance in the land. When we read the word inheritance, the inheritance uh, points to land. Because they say, well, why does it point? To, well, because the earth and everything in it, the earth belongs to the Lord. So if he's going to give it, or, so if someone's going to have land, they have to get it from God. So, it, 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 so this is the matter of inheritance. Israel's priests ate of sacrifices of the altar. So that's where they got their food was uh was of the altar so it was good it was good to eat lots of meat that's why they were partakers of the altar yes the benefit they, they for were, them yes they, <laughs> they they were partakers of the altar so Joshua 13 14 if you uh, want to note this it was only unto the tribe uh, tri tribe again <laughs> tribe tribe of Levi he gave none inheritance so the Levites had no land, no land. The sacrifices of the Lord God of Israel made by fire are their inheritance, as he said unto them. So what they were to do then, when, when a sacrifice was brought to the altar and was made, they were, uh, they were the ones that were to eat of that sacrifice. So that's how they kept fed. What say I then? That, that the idol is anything or that which is offered in sacrifice to idols is anything. Now remember, they're they're thinking about their communion with uh, uh, Jesus and his sacrifice. And now they've got this matter of these idols. They're living in society now. They're no longer just in Israel. They're in Corinth. They're surrounded by pagans who do all sorts of abominable things. And so they're, they're having to deal with this. Paul, having written to flee idolatry, will explain that just eating meat sacrificed to an idol will not make them an idol worshiper. Now that might sound like a simple statement, but for them, this was difficult. The issue was separating in practice eating that which was offered to the Lord, whom they worshipped, from eating that which was offered to an idol, which they must not worship. So they have, to, they have to think about this and be careful what they do here. This was a mental difficulty for the saints, not the call to be saints. It was difficult for the saints of the circumcision whose conscience was bothered so they're thinking am i am i making a mistake here am i doing something wrong am i going to upset the lord god so this was less of an issue for the uncircumcised called to be saints why because the uncircumcised called to be saints these uncircumcised hebrews were never under the law well they were only under the law for seven days <laughs> and then on the eighth day when they weren't circumcised they were cut off from the commonwealth of israel and they they just they weren't they were no longer living under law so it wasn't so much an issue for them but it was an issue for the saints who were brought up under the law what say I then, that an idol is anything, or that which is offered in sacrifice to idols is anything? So Paul says, and, and so we're going to recall here and have Vivian read this. First Corinthians chapter 8, verse 4. 
As concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, and that there, and that there is none other but God but one. Okay, so this is this is instruction that Paul has already given. We've already been through chapter eight, and then continuing on at uh, verse seven. First Corinthians chapter eight, verse seven. How be it? There is not in every man that knowledge. Isn't that interesting? There is not in every man that knowledge. He, Paul says, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, but not every not every one of the saints realizes this. Um, and then uh, for... Continuing on in 1 Corinthians 8, verse 7. For some, with conscience of the idol, unto this hour eat it as a thing offered unto an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. Okay, so here's the here's the mental difficulty, and they're going, ah, I just eat, I've just eaten something. I think it's, I think it was, uh, I think it was made a, a sacrifice to an idol. God's going to be upset with me. I'm going to die. So there, there was real concern amongst the saints, and they were almost panicky about these things. Their conscience could be defiled, and it was, it was panic so they would rather just sort of stay away from these things now paul says but i say that the things with the gentiles sacrifice they sacrifice to devils and not to god and i would not that you should have fellowship with devils so now what paul is going to do is he's going to now separate this matter of fellowship it's not the eating of the meat it's this fellowship. It's worshiping and fellowship with devils. So for the saints, they're to they're to uh, Paul's trying to help them to delineate just eating meat that was sacrificed to an idol from eating and fellowshipping. So the Gentiles of the nations that that would be the the con the context they were speaking about Gentiles of the nations sacrificed to their devil gods and not to the God of heaven and earth. And we know that from Acts 17, 24. The call to be saints and the saints, so both groups, both mystery and prophecy, saints, were not to have fellowship with devils. So he says, I would not that you should have fellowship with devils. And then so in Acts 17, 29, Mm -hmm. Acts 17, 29. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone, graven by art and man's device. Okay, so, so Paul, Paul has here this instruction which he first gave to the pagans on Mars Hill. And he speaks about that we are, he's, to the pagans, he said, we are the offspring of God. Now, that doesn't mean that we're all the children of God. Uh, because the word offspring can be construed as, as saying, oh, we're all the children. No, what we are, now this is from the Oxford English Dictionary, offspring, that's a sense number two, figurative, that which springs or is produced by something. So we are all produced by God. We are, we are of God. We are the product of God. And then he says, Paul says that, God, this God is not some graven art or man's device, which is man's imagination. Uh, you can see evidence of God all over the creation. That is the God by whom we live, move, and have our being. All right, so now in verses 21 to 22, now, so Paul is bringing us down to the real issue, and that is the issue of the Lord's table. He cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. Again, the issue is worship. It's not the eating or the drinking, but it is the worship. He cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and, and of table of devils. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? So this is that Paul is going to be working on separating this matter of worship from just simply eating. You can eat, you can pop something in your mouth, and it's not going to make any difference. But if you participate in worship, that's a problem. So the serious consequences for this violation 
of instruction that, you know, not to make the Lord jealous. Don't be involved in the worship. You, if you're going to go to a party uh, and they're worshiping and you're going there to eat, you be careful. Don't you participate in that worship. So there were serious consequences for this, and we're going to see those very serious consequences when we get to chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians. Uh, chapter 11, th these serious consequences, I think more Bible expositors have difficulty with what Paul is writing because it's, it's actually hard to accept what is being said, and especially so if I were to think that I'm a saint because what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, 27 to 31 sounds catastrophic if you put it to what it really means or what it's really what's really being said. But if I separate the audiences to where they belong, it's not an issue. So both the call to be saints and the saints were permitted to eat meat sacrifice to idols. Sacrifice to idols, not an issue. However, they must have nothing to do with idols, nothing to do with respect to any of the worship, any of the carousing around the idols, uh, 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 anything that had to do with lifting up the idol in any sense. They were to just stay away from that. But they could certainly pop whatever meat was on the table, pop it in their mouth and enjoy it. And, and just because it's, it's just meat. All right, now we're gonna we're gonna go into the final section of First Corinthians 10, uh, chapter ten, verses twenty three to thirty three. Now the focus is going to be very much on the saints. Uh, so there were matters of conscience which concerned the saints, especially when they ate uh, out, like go out to eat, and there's something called the shambles. Uh, and so they went, and, and that's where, that was a meat market, and that, that word, the shambles, that's in the Bible, biblical word, the shambles, it's a meat market. So the saints would go out, and they would find themselves in the shambles, and they would, there was meat sold there, and, and pretty high quality meat, and they were to understand uh, so that they could uh, not be conf uh, conflicted in conscience over these meats. Okay, moving into now these final verses. First Corinthians chapter 10, verses 23 and 24. All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. Let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. All right, so Paul says all things are lawful, but all things are not expedient. Now, so I, I, I take this in. All things are lawful. What's expedient? It, it not necessarily fit or proper. So it may be lawful, but again, so think about it. Is it fit? Is it proper? Is it suitable? He's telling them. Think about whether or not it's expedient. And he says all things are lawful, but all things do not, uh, but all things edify not. They're not edifying. That is, it may be lawful, but it doesn't build up. And so he wants them to think about things. Think about it for yourself. And it's specifically to those who were mindful of the law. Exactly. The, who were the saints. They had to not, be not critical them. thinkers. Mm -hmm. uh, the saints had to think. So, so, and today, this is wisdom for us. Even today, believers benefit by being clear, thinking clearly, thinking critically, critical thinkers, would it be expedient? That is, is it fit and proper? Would it edify? Would it be wise? So there are all sorts of things that I as a believer could do today, which will not consign me to hell because I'm saved and sealed and seated. I can do things, but they're not proper, so I should just stay away from them. Now, the only way I can I can come to that conclusion is by thinking about it, using my own brain that God has given me. Let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. That's kind of an odd statement. Am I supposed to 
uh, look for another man's wealth and not worry about my own? Well, what Paul is saying here in terms of the context and the sense is, don't worry about your own wealth. Be concerned about another man's wealth. Think about what will benefit another. Now, this is important uh, in the matter of eating. You're going to eat, do things that are going to be of benefit in this category as well to the benefit of others. Okay, now we're going to continue on. Now we're moving into the shambles. First Corinthians chapter 10, verses 25 and 26. Whatsoever is sold in the shambles, that eat, asking no question for conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. All right, so whatsoever is sold in the shambles, that eat. So what's, what's a shamble? A shamble is a place, is a meat market where meat is sold. You don't know anything about the meat at all. It's just there on the table and... You look at it and go, oh, look, that's a tenderloin. And look at the price. It is cheap. He says, just whatever sold there, just eat it. And ask, asking no questions for conscience sake. This is actually, ignorance is, ignorance is good in this case. And then there's a colon. So the explanation here follows for the, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. So what Paul says, you don't need to ask any questions because it all belongs to God anyhow. It all belongs to God. All right, now we'll continue on. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 27 through 30. If any of them that believe not bid you to a feast, and ye be disposed to go, whatsoever is set before you, eat, asking no questions for conscience sake. But if any man say unto you, This is offered in sacrifice unto idols, eat not for his sake that showed it, and for conscience sake, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Conscience, I say, not thine own, but of the other. For why is my liberty judged of another man's conscience? For if I by grace be a partaker, why am I evil spoken of for that which I give thanks? Okay, so now this is why the saints had to think their way through these things, get themselves comfortable. If if any of them that believe not, oh, this is an interesting, them that believe not, that would be Gentiles, Gentiles of the nation. You know these Gentiles of the nations, you're living among them. They believe not, but they bid you to a feast, and ye be disposed to go. This is an interesting little scenario. You've got an invitation to a feast, and ye be disposed to go. That is, you think, yeah, that sounds good. Let's go out. So, so disposed is inclined, in the mood. Yeah. You're going, what have we got in the fridge? Nothing. Well, let's go out. <laughs> so you're, you're disposed to go. Whatsoever is set before you, Paul says, eat. So, so this is not the kind of restaurant that we go to today where you order off a menu and uh, they had one thing cooked. And when you sat down there at that feast, they plopped something in front of you. And whatever was set in front of you, Paul says, whatever is there, just eat it. It sort of reminds me of my father. <laughs> so my father is used to a mostly Armenian diet because his, his wife, my mother, was inclined to cook the kind of food that he was used to having from his mother, uh, who were and they were they were the first ones to come over from Armenia, uh, and so my she, so my father was raised mostly on an Armenian diet. When my father came to our house for <laughs> dinner. My British wife would set before him not an Armenian dish, but a, a more of a British dish, like roast. And, and my father would often say to my mother in Armenian, he would, he would ask her, what is this? <laughs> <laughs> what is this? And my mother would say to him, respond to him in Armenian, she would say, just eat it. And he would. Asking no questions for conscience sake. So 
it was better for the saints not to know what had been set before them to eat. So you see that Paul is consistent here. He says, you can eat meat which has been sacrificed to idol, but you don't want to know about it. You don't, you, you don't want to know anything about the history. It looks good. It's okay to eat. And your conscience will not be bothered. Exactly. Because an idol is nothing. Exactly. So, but now, now there's a shift. But, so Paul says, but if any man say unto you, this is offered in sacrifice unto idols, eat not for his sake that showed it. So the server comes and he's going to, he puts it down in front of you. And he says, oh, he says, by the way, this is, this was weird. Just, this is hot off the altar from the, from the idol. He says, don't, Paul says, oh, that one don't eat. Now, again, you have to be, they had to be thinking individuals. They had to discern uh, the scenarios. And he says, he did not for his sake that showed it and for conscience sake of another saint. So there's another saint that's going to be in proximity. And if the other saint knows that you just found out that this is something that was sacrificed to idols, even though an idol is nothing, Paul says, don't eat it for the conscience sake of another saint that may see what you're doing for the earth is the lord's and the fullness thereof so paul repeats what he said in verse 26 he says just reminder everything belongs to the lord but for conscience sake conscience paul i say not thine own but of the other so for why is my liberty judged of another man's conscience so in, in other words if the other saint saw you tucking in to meet sacrifice to an idol, they would be horrified, uh, and and their conscience would also then be damaged. So Paul is giving them very specific instructions. This is for these saints. For if I by grace be a partaker, why am I evil spoken of? for that which I give thanks. So he says, you know, I, I know it belongs to the Lord. I've given thanks of it. Why am I being spoken evil of? Because of the other man's conscience. So the wisdom here, here's the wisdom. And actually this, this extends to us, even to this day. I should avoid any situation where my actions may be faulted or spoken evil of, even by another believer. So, if we so there have been times that Vivian and I have been in a restaurant and we've had a glass of wine on the table and we had believers from our church walk by we didn't know we're there and they saw us at our table with a glass of wine in front of us and they were shocked that they were shocked that we would have wine with our meal because to their thinking that was wrong now, it is not my place to try and justify myself. I am automatically wrong for harming their conscience. Therefore, I must be very circumspect, careful. We must not hurt another believer's conscience. So the, the issue is with me, not with the other person. It's on me to be careful. That's the wisdom. Okay. We're moving ahead, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 31 through 33. Whether therefore ye eat or drink, or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Give none offence, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. Even as I please all men in all things, not seeking mine own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. Okay, so... Whether it's so a verse 31, whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. So I, I can do that to this day. Eat, drink, whatever I do, do to the glory of God. The reason to do all to the glory of God is going to show up in verse 33. So we'll just hold that off for a moment here. Now, verse 32 is instruction that none is to none are to be offended so we, we we just spoke about how i can offend another believer 
uh, believers uh, that have are saved by the grace of God, uh, and they have they hold other doctrines. Uh, they can be offended. I should not offend even a believer who holds to other doctrines. I should I should control myself. I should be disciplined not to offend anybody. And, and there's no justification for me to offend somebody just because they're more legalistic. And I say, well, they're so legalistic that it's okay for me to offend them. Nope, I'm wrong. Automatically, I'm wrong. Now, at the beginning of this chapter 10, this is where this verse 32, we used as the lead verse 32, give none offense neither to the Jews. So what did they believe? Nor to the Gentiles. What did they believe? Nor to the church of God. So these three groups, they all believe something. And Paul says, don't give offense to them. He's going to explain the reason not to offend them in verse 33. So, Give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor the Gentiles, nor the Church of God. The Jews, the Gentiles, the Church of God. We'll look at each one. The Jews. What did the Jews believe? The Jews believed in Jehovah God. So even Caiaphas, the high priest that led the Sanhedrin in condemnation of Jesus to the cross, he was a believer in Jehovah God. That is from Exodus chapter 6, verse 7. It doesn't mention Caiaphas specifically, but that's where Israel, the Hebrew, became believers in Jehovah God was when they left the, the pagan Egyptians. And, and the Jews came out of uh, the Israelites. They, the Jews were the ones that had the oracles of God. Yes. They were keeping the law. They were keeping the traditions. Right. And they felt that they were above everyone else. Yeah, because they did. They believed in Jehovah God. Yeah, they had the knowledge of Jehovah, the one true God. Mm -hmm. Now you say, well, how do you know that that Caiaphas was a believer? Because he adjured Jesus by the living God that if he be the Christ. Now, now Jesus didn't challenge him. He didn't say, Ah, oh, you don't believe. I don't have to answer you. Caiaphas did believe in Jehovah God. Now he was pretty messed up in what he believed. Uh, he because he didn't believe the oracles of God. He had every Caiaphas had every advantage, but he didn't believe the oracles. What he believed though was just Jehovah God. Then there are the Gentiles. Now the Gentiles think more inclusive of all the uncircumcised, uh, all the uncircumcised of the nations. That their belief is in God's of man's device. That's we take that from Acts 17, 29. And the gods of man's device would be the gods of man's imagination. So there are these Gentiles in the world, and they they believe, they believe according to their imagination. And if you just think about people that you have had contact with who you know do not believe in the one true God. What do they believe in? They believe in something of their own imagination. And then finally, there is the church of God. Paul says, no offense to the church of God. Why not the church of God? Well, the church of God, which started in Jerusalem, they believed in Jehovah God, just like uh, those uh, that started at Exodus 6-7, but they believed something more. They believed in the gospel of God. That's from John 14, 1, where Jesus said, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God. Believe, so that's Jehovah God. Believe also in me. That's the, the gospel of God. That's the good news that the promise of a Messiah is fulfilled in the person of Jesus. So we get we, we have that from Romans chapter 1, the first four verses. If you read Romans chapter 1, the first four verses, you'll see the word promise. That means it's, it was in the scriptures. So the church of God believed in Jehovah God and the promised Messiah that it was, in fact, Jesus. Mm -hmm. Okay. And Paul says, don't offend these three groups. Who's he speaking to? He's speaking to uh, about. about. And, so he, and he's, this is instruction to the saints and the call to be saints. Don't offend. 
Now, verse 33, and here's the explanation. Paul says, even as I pleased all men in all things. So you see how accommodating Paul, Paul was accommodating, continuously accommodating of all men in all things, not just some men sometime or some men for a while and then no more after a while. It was all men, all things, all the time. Mm -hmm. Not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many. Notice this, many. Not all, but many. That many that they may be saved. So here's Paul's objective. For the, for the three groups, the Jews, the Gentiles, and the church of God, that they may be saved. That is, by the gospel of grace. His gospel. Now, why does Paul say saved by his gospel? Because Paul's gospel is the only one that not only saves, but seals a person permanently. That you become a possession of God and you can and you can no longer, you can, I cannot lose my salvation. Paul wanted every Jew, every Gentile, every member of the church of God to not just be saved, but to be sealed by the grace of God, by his, by his uh, gospel. So Paul said, can I just say one thing? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you uh, could say two things. Uh, uh, but Paul speaks about this gospel, the grace of God, he calls it the gospel of Christ. Yes. In Romans chapter one, verses 16 and 17. Mm -hmm. So Paul says, uh, 1 Corinthians 9, 22 B, Paul says, I am made all things to all men that I might by all means save some. That is Paul's objective. He says not all are going to be saved. Paul recognized not all are going to be saved, but Paul was making every effort to save, uh, as, to many. save as many as possible. So save some. By all means, save some. 1 Corinthians 4, 16. And then he says, to, he says to the saints in the call to be saints, he says, follow me. That is, do as I do. You too, work with me that, that by all means, some men will be saved. Okay, so that, that takes us to the end of uh, chapter 10. And I don't think I'm going to step into chapter 11 because I don't think we can... We don't have sufficient time to really do it justice, and I don't want to rush through it. So we will save um, chapter 11 for next time, where we will go into, again, where Paul speaks about, be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Now, this is a matter of, of now precedent that Paul says, I'm learning things from Christ. These are new revelation. So, and I'm giving it to you, you follow me. So we'll, we'll start that uh, next time when we continue uh, in our study in 1 Corinthians.